a long time ago, I worked at a big US bank. And back then, we deployed to production every quarter. So every three months, we would deploy our code to production, uh, we being the bank. Uh, so that would mean every three months, we'd deploy the mobile API for the mobile app I was working on, and also all of the website changes for the last three months, and also all of the software updates for all of the ATMs in the ATM network, and also the COBOL code, and the Fortran code, and the VAX assembly, and the mainframes. And that was all done on one long weekend. They turned off everything and had a lot of stressful uh, conversations and tapping on keyboards, and then hopefully turned it back on before Monday morning, uh, or maybe Tuesday morning. Uh, so this talk is about avoiding that experience. Anyone who's been through those kind of like big bang migrations where you take a lot of outage will know that it is not fun. Um, if you haven't, congratulations. Uh, so I want to talk about why those kind of big bang migrations are so painful. Uh, I'm going to talk about some patterns that you can use instead of doing these big bang migrations. And we could do that using um, a real world example uh, or a few real, real world examples. Um, so I am the CTO at a startup. This startup exists in the year 2024. Uh, therefore, we're doing things with AI. I'm not going to talk to you about AI. Don't worry. There's been a lot of conversations about AI. Uh, but we, we were doing something with AI. So we had this generative AI service. And uh, this was using a technique called RAG. You don't really need to know what that means. But it, it essentially means we were, we were talking to a, uh, we needed just like this specialized database, this thing called a vector store. Uh, that we could ask questions and then do our AI magic with the results from this, from this vector store. And we needed to load information into that vector store uh, using this separate service or separate system that was kind of ingesting data in this pipeline. So we had a thing that was reading from the vector store and a thing that was loading data into the vector store. And for the proof of concept that we initially built, we used a technology called Pinecone for that database. Um, and over time, we uh, decided for various reasons that I'm not going to talk about uh, that we wanted to shift from Pinecone to Postgres, which is uh, the database that we use for like everything else at our organization. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how we did that. Um, and you know, to summarize, what we were doing is we were, we, wanted, we were starting the situation where everything's writing to Pinecone, everything's being read from Pinecone. We wanted to take all of the stuff that was in Pinecone, move it to Postgres, and then read and write from Postgres. Uh, super common thing to do, like super common big architectural migration, um, and kind of quite challenging to do um, without a bit of a ruckus. So um, the simplest way to do this, maybe, would be to do this kind of big bang migration. So how, does, how would we do that? Well, so the first thing we would do uh, is we'd stop the world. So turn off access to these systems so that we could change stuff. Um, and then we'd backfill the data. So we'd take all the data that's in Pinecone, move it to Postgres. And then we'd cut over. So we'd reconfigure our reader and our writer to talk to the new system rather than the old system. Um, and then we'd start the world again. And you have to do this during, uh, you have to take downtime to do this because um, while you're doing this kind of like backfill, you don't want more data entering the system. And also there's kind of inconsistencies with the data. So you have to take, um, have to take downtime. And going through this kind of experience, I, the, the, what I think of is it's kind of like one of those like bank heist movies where they break into the bank at night. And the boss is like, the cops will be here in 15 minutes and 12 seconds. Go, go, go. And then there's people like shoveling the cash into the bags and like running them out to the van, right? And you're like backfilling the data. And like, how many megabytes have we got left to go? The, the cops are going to be here in 12 seconds or 12 minutes, right? And the person is like, it was supposed to take two minutes, but it's been five minutes now. And the other person's like, well, uh, how long is it going to take? And I, I, we didn't build a progress bar. I don't know. Um, <laughs> It's a very stressful experience, right? And um, likewise, like even once you've done that backfilling, the, the, the cutover um, is, once you've done that cutover, now you've got to test that things look right in the new system. And you're doing that quickly because you're taking downtime. And you're, you're in this kind of stressful situation where you want to verify that everything works, um, but you want to do it as quickly as possible so that you can start the world, get out of the bank before the cops show up. So these um, 
types of migrations, like I said, are, are no fun, right? And the, the biggest problem with them is we have to stop the world, uh, which means our users are taking downtime, which also means it's stressful for us. Um, these types of migrations are really hard to test thoroughly before you do them in production. The shape of the data in your production systems is usually different. The scale of the data in your production systems is often different. And also the infrastructure in your production systems is very often different from your pre-production systems. So it's really hard to get confidence that the backfill is going to take the amount of time that you think it's going to take. It's really hard to get confidence that you've covered all the different edge cases. And the worst part is, after you've done that cutover, if you don't test really well, then um, things can go really wrong. So let's say we've, we've done our cutover, we've tested, we've got confident, we went to bed, and then we wake up the next morning, users are showing up in, in the system, and uh, as load comes in, maybe the latency in our system is kind of going higher than we'd expected. Or as certain types of user are showing up in the morning, they're noticing that there's some weird bug that wasn't there before um, that we didn't spot because we didn't test with that type of user. Um, and because we've cut over to the new system and we've been writing to the new system since we like, ended our downtime, we now can't really go back. We've kind of burnt the boats because if we even if we could easily reconfigure our systems to talk to, uh, in this case, Pinecone rather than Postgres, all the data that we've written to Postgres would not be in Pinecone. And so we'd basically just lose any data that we've had since the outage. So then we kind of, someone says, well, can we do a reverse backfill somehow? And then someone says, well, we've, we did think about that, but we haven't actually tested it. And if we do that, we are going to have to take some, another round of downtime. The whole thing is not a fun experience. This is like, to me, when I think about uh, doing these kind of big bang migrations, this is the thing that kind of gives me a, a real migraine, is what happens if things go really wrong and we don't have a plan B. So big bang migrations, are, they suck. Uh, so what's, uh, what's an alternative? So uh, I'm going to talk about this pattern called expand contract as an alternative. So how does an expand contract version of this work? We start in the, in the same situation where we're reading and writing to Pinecone. The first thing we do is we make a change to our production system so that we're now writing to both systems in parallel. Some period of time later, we make a change and start backfilling the data from, uh, from Pinecone to Postgres. Once that backfill is complete, we now have two systems that have the exact same data going forward. And they're kind of synchronized, right? Because the old data is in both places. We backfilled it. And the new data is being written to both places. So now, at a time of our choosing, we can uh, cut over to the new, uh, the new system. And um, again, like at a time of our choosing. And then after we've gained confidence that nothing's gone wrong, there's no users complaining, the latency looks good, et cetera, et cetera, we can stop writing to the old system unplug the Pinecone server, take it to the field at the back of the data center, and attack it with baseball bats. Um, so this is a much more pleasurable experience. We're not taking any downtime at any point. Each of these changes is something we can do to our live production system without affecting our users. And if anything goes wrong in each of these steps, it's not really that big a deal. If uh, write, writing to the new system somehow has a bug in it, uh, it's writing bad data, or it's like got bad latency or whatever, just stop writing for a while. No one's reading from that new system. Uh, stop writing, fix the bug, deploy a new change to production, see if that works. Likewise with our backfill. If our backfill that was supposed to take two minutes is taking two hours, we don't really care, right? Like no one's using the Postgres system. It's a kind of a bummer because we thought it was going to be quicker, but not a big deal. Likewise, if there's bugs in the backfill, fix the bug, nuke the database, start again. Not a big deal. The cutover, if we cut over and things look bad, cut back. If we cut over and two weeks later things look bad, we cut back because we've been keeping the two systems in sync the whole time. So the way I think about um, the, the difference between these two approaches is kind of like if you're trying to cross, like, or you're trying to walk on a, an icy lake and you're not quite sure how thick the ice is. 
the Big Bang migration is you just kind of jump into the middle of the lake and find out. The expand contract is you kind of take a step forward, see how things look, if they look good, take another step forward. If the, you start hearing a weird creaking sound, take a step back, take your time, assess what's going on, get confident, take your next step forward. So for me, expand contract is, is the, the core for why it is beneficial is because it gives you confidence. Um, because you're making this small series of steps, independent steps, and you're able to take a step back, pause, or take a step back at any time, you can move with confidence, which actually means you can move faster. Even though the expand contract version of this requires like four or five or six production deployments rather than one, I can still move faster, and I can be doing these kind of migrations basically all the time, many of them in parallel maybe at a larger organization, without a bunch of planning for the big outage that we're going to be having where we have to make sure we're all going to be there on the weekend and do we have a plan B and um, all that kind of stuff. OK, so let's, let's take a look at um, what this looks like in, in, in code. So here's, so here's an example of uh, how we actually did this when we were moving from PineGround to Postgres. So this is the dual write part. So at the top here, we're just kind of the, doing the data processing part, getting our data ready to write to the system, uh, write to the vector store. And then uh, down here, we just write to two vector stores. We're not doing like some advanced distributed systems, like data synchronization, like change data capture, blah, blah, blah. We're just writing to two places. It's not rocket science. It doesn't require a bunch of extra work. You already have to write the code that's going to write to the new system. So just write to both systems at the same time. Uh, likewise, with the cutover, pretty straightforward. Whenever we want to pull some data from the vector store so that we can do our AI magic on the data, we uh, look at a feature flag and we say, should I read from the old system or the new system? And then based on that feature flag, we read from the old system or the new system, and then we return the result to the thing that actually wants the data. And because both of these systems implement the same interface in our code, the rest of our, the rest of our code base doesn't care where the data came from. It just says, hey, vector store, give me some data. And it really doesn't give two hoots whether it came from Pinecone or Postgres. So again, nothing super sophisticated there. And we used a feature flag. So um, kind of to make it a little bit more obvious, the way that would work is the feature flag's off. We'd read from Pinecone. If the feature flag is on, we'd read from Postgres. Now, that's the kind of the most straightforward way of using a feature flag. But we could get a little bit more fancy and treat that feature flag as a slider. So when the slider is at 0%, we send all of our traffic, all of our requests, all of our reads go to Pinecone. We could turn that slider up to 5%. Every time our AI service wants to read something from the vector store, we kind of flip a coin. And 5% of the time, we read from Postgres. The rest of the time, we read from Pinecone. That lets us kind of dip our toe in the water, to mix my metaphors, um, and, and figure out, like, is this system working well without the risk of just like switching everyone over to the new system? So this is often called a canary release or a canary launch. And we could even do something like turn that slider to 50% and just sometimes you get it from Pinecone, sometimes you get it from Postgres. They're supposed to be equivalent, so why not, right? So this is kind of like a architectural or kind of technical version of an A-B test. It's the exact same idea of using a feature flag to send traffic to or to, to serve up one of two experiences. It's just the experience is, is a technical experience rather than a user-facing experience. Now, if you are going to use a technique like this kind of canary release, it behooves you to think about observability. Um, and think about how you're able to observe the, the behavior of, uh, of your system when you're, you're doing this kind of canary experimentation. So this is a simulation of me uh, turning, turning the feature flag from 0% to 5%. Um, and uh, I'd like to see, anyone, if you, any of you want to guess like where in this timeline did I make that change? You would think it's one of these peaks, right? The, the peaks actually, like by happy coincidence, was just like random noise on my laptop when I was running the simulation. Uh, the actual point I did it was, was right here. Um, so it turns out 
this feature flag has no impact on latency, right? Actually, if you break the requests up by which request had the feature flag on, which request had the feature flag off, uh-oh. Like, actually, it's twice as slow. That would be a nice thing to know. If you don't have your feature flags instrumented and in your observability platform, you're going to see that top graph, and you'll never know that you've doubled your latency until you start turning it up to 50%. So it's really important that when you're, if you're using feature flags in any kind of like sophisticated way, that you're able to observe the effects of your feature, bags, feature flags and kind of close that loop. We happen to be at KubeCon and CloudNativeCon. Um, there's two CNCF projects that you may have heard of. Open Feature, uh, which is uh, a project that I'm on the governance board for, um, and Open Telemetry. Um, both of these are open standards that sit in front of a bunch of different backend systems. And if you're using these two um, open source projects, these two CNCF projects, you get that instrumentation for free. If you're evaluating a feature flag in Open Feature, that shows up automatically in your open telemetry instrumentation, in your observability. And what that means is if you're using any of the vendors there for open feature and any of those vendors for uh, open telemetry, you get this observability around your feature flags for free. This is why open standards are amazing. Rather than doing like n times m integrations, like an integration between Datadog and Flagsmith, and an integration between Datadog and LaunchDarkly, et cetera, et cetera, we do one integration between these two open standards. And any combination of these, you get that observability for free. So yay, CNCF. Open standards are cool. OK, I want to take a step back a little bit from talking about expand contract and, and kind of talk about it in really abstract terms. What are we doing when we're doing these expand contract operations? It comes down to these kind of three things. We're standing up the new version of the thing. We're keeping the state synchronized between those two things so that we could use either of those things um, as we want. And then we're kind of choosing at runtime, or at least dynamically, we're choosing where we want to, which system we want to send traffic to. So run both things in parallel, keep the state synchronized between the two of them, and then dynamically make choices as to which one is, is going to receive uh, your traffic. And it turns out that you can use this approach for like a ton of different types of technical migrations. So I was using this example of changing a database where most people first get introduced to expand contracts is with database schema changes. You stand up the new schema, you copy the data into the new schema and kind of keep the two in sync. So now you've got the old schema and the new schema. Then you choose where you want to read from. Right? It's the exact same pattern, but just a different flavor. Likewise, API changes. Likewise, moving a system from, you know, from Heroku to Kubernetes or whatever. Um, you can follow the exact same pattern of run the old and the new side by side, keep the data in sync, and then cut between the two, or even send traffic to both of them at the same time in your choosing. So I think that's really important to wrap your head around, is this is a very general technique that you can use to avoid uh, downtime and to avoid stressful migrations. So we talked about um, choosing, we talked a little bit about this idea of kind of like a canary release and, and going from, from uh, you know, sending 5% of traffic to, to your new system versus your old system. And there's a kind of spectrum of like more and more fancy things you can do with this kind of traffic routing, right? The most simplistic is you just like if you want to start using the new system, you deploy a production change that reconfigures your code, or like you know literally rewrites your code to talk to the new system. Or you can want to get more fancy than that. You can use a feature flag. Once you've got that feature flag in place, you can do the fancy thing with a slider and do some A/B testing or canary launching. Um, let's talk about an even more <clears throat> an even more fancy thing that we can do. So here's another example, also from my past. Um, 
So this is a situation where we had um, a system that did accounting, or part of the system that did accounting. So it told me what the bank balance was of, of Joe Blogs. And we wanted to pull that uh, module out into a microservice because microservices were trendy at the time. And we needed to improve our resumes. So this is another example of a situation where you can use expand contract, right? Keep the old system running, stand up the new system side by side, keep the two things in, in sync, and then when you want to pull the, the account balance for Joe Blogs, choose where you're sending that traffic. How would you choose where you're sending that traffic? So a pretty common approach for this is to kind of put a shim in front of that existing internal system. So you, now you've got an interface that looks like the accounting module, but actually all it does is pass the request through to the actual accounting module. And then you rewire your internal code a little bit, do a little refactoring so that it's always talking to the shim. So now, whenever anything talks to that accounting module, that traffic, the requests, the method calls, go through that shim. And with that shim in place, we can decide where that traffic goes. So now we can say, you know, you're asking for the account balance for Jane Smith. I'm going to send you to the accounting service and get the answer from there. Or maybe I'll change it, you know, make a different choice for 5% of my users, whatever. So you, the, again, exact same patterns, just applied in quite different contexts. So here's like what that looks like, right? In zoomed in detail, we've got our shim, we've got our feature flag. If the feature flag's on, we go to one system. If the feature flag's off, we go to the other system. Exactly the same idea. What about if we did something even fancier and went to both systems at the same time? So now what I'm going to do is whenever someone asks for the bank account for Joe Blogs, I'm going to go to both of the systems at once and get the answer from both systems at once. Why would I want to do that? So that I can check whether both of the systems are giving me the same answer. It is pretty dang important that we get the same answer when we ask for the account balance for a user. I do not want to mess this up. And so I'm willing to do all of this extra plumbing and run these two systems in parallel for quite a while, just in case. Like, I've done a bunch of testing. We're pretty dang sure that the account balance from the new system is always the same. But why not do this check? And we're not even using the result from the new system for a while. We're just throwing it away. So as part of making this production change of moving to this new service, we just kind of like start sending it traffic. We kind of dark launch it and start sending it traffic. We throw away the answers, but we're checking to verify that once we do start using the answers, they correspond with what's in the old system. I'm a really big fan of this technique. Um, Maybe I'm just risk averse or I'm just good at writing bad code. Um, but it, it helps me sleep at night and it helps me move faster because I can just, like, I can YOLO this. I can literally just, like, I don't know what I'm doing. Let's deploy it to production. No one's seeing the results. Let's find out how much of the time I get it wrong, right? It gives you a lot of confidence, which means you can actually move faster. So here's, a, here's what that looked like. In, um, so, so I'm a fan of this approach. We used this approach when we were moving from Pinecone to Postgres because the way that we were writing the data to these two uh, data stores was slightly different. The internals of the data stores like work differently in the capabilities, so the way we were storing it needed to look different. But we wanted to make sure that when we asked those two different sources for information, it came back with the same results. So, we just ask whenever we need to know, you know, whenever we want to pull data from, from those systems in order to do AI magic, we just go to both of the systems, ask for, which, ask for the, um, the, the results, and then we, uh, we do this little check to see if there's a discrepancy, and, and then we throw away the results from the new system and return the new one. And if there is a discrepancy, obviously, we're like throwing alerts into our observability platform, and logs are going off, and sirens, et cetera, et cetera. We're not just kind of just blindly checking, but this is a way for us to gain confidence in the new system without kind of diving all the way into committing to it. And the details of like how we did that, that check, I'm, I'm not going to go into, but um, they tend to be in this kind of situation where you care a lot about the domain-specific kind of like consistency from the two systems, you end up writing like quite a lot of domain specific code that's like verifying the details of does the answer from the old system 
look kind of like the answer from the new system. They're not identical. You're not like doing a JSON diff and saying, are these the exact same bytes? Because often you're changing things as you're moving to a new system. But you're, you're, you're asking like semantically, is the result the same um, between these two systems? So I, I referred to that idea of kind of like running them in parallel and then kind of throwing away the results from the old system as a dark launch. And that phrase, I think, came from Facebook. Um, so a long time ago, they were rolling out Facebook chat. And they were doing it on a bunch of like fancy new technology. I think they were writing this, like the servers were Erlang, I think. Um, and they wanted to kind of test that it was ready to go live. Because you can imagine Facebook gets a reasonable amount of traffic. And they weren't really sure that all of this shiny new tech could stand up to it. So what they did was they wrote some code, put some code into the uh, some JavaScript code into like the, the, the Facebook web app. And it would, in the background, find some of your friends in your network and kind of fake send them messages using this new system. You weren't seeing anything in the UI. You had no idea this was going on. But it was like picking a friend at random and sending them like a lorem ipsum like, test message that was going through all of their real backend infrastructure that they were planning to go live showing up in that person's web browser where this JavaScript was like detecting it and kind of probably logging something like, yep, got the message or whatever. No one saw anything from this. It was totally in the dark. They were basically using like a portion of their users as like a big load testing service. Um, but a really nice way of, of making this, testing this change without um, like de-risking a big, scary technical change. And when I've given this, uh, kind of talked about this before and given this talk before, normally someone says, we do that too at large system X. Like I gave a, a, a version of this talk, and someone was like, I'm at Instagram. We do this all the time for all of our systems. Like once you hit a certain scale, the way you do load testing is on your users. And ideally, you're, you're doing it kind of with something like a dark launch so they don't even know it's happening. OK. so. In conclusion, I think the biggest takeaway that I want you to take from this is you don't need to do downtime. Like most of the time, you don't need to take downtime. There's almost always a way to make a big, scary change as a set of small, safe changes. It takes like longer, but it's safer uh, and, and more acceptable. And something like expand contract is normally uh, the, the right approach. I never explained why it's called expand contract. It's called expand contract because you're kind of expanding the system to support both the old and the new thing. And then once you're confident in the new thing, you're kind of contracting and removing the old thing. That's why it's called expand contract. Um, yeah, so it's, it's, it's a very general purpose pattern. It feels at first like, oh, it's, it's mainly for database migrations. It's actually applicable for a bunch of different, tech, uh, bunch of different types of large technical migration. Um, and once you've got your head around the basics, there's a lot of like more fancy kind of variants of it you can do, like canary launches and dark launches and parallel run and all this kind of stuff. So once you've got that kind of basic idea in place, you can start getting fancy. But you don't need to, right? You can just use it. Most of the time when I use this, I'm not even using a feature flag. I'm just like making the change with like a commenting out the code. Like literally with that pinecone thing, I literally just commented out the code um, and then deployed and then eventually deleted the code. Um, so yeah, you don't need to get fancy, but you can if you want. Um, and if you're using feature flags, which you know in general I would recommend, um, doing, using observability is is key if you want to get real insights into any experiment, right? Like if you're doing an A/B test, of course you're going to look at the results of the A/B test, right? You're going to look at the experiment. Um, so things like open feature and open telemetry make that way easy. So again, uh, yay for open standards. Thank you. And we have a ton of a time, ton of time for questions. So if you have questions, step up to the mic over there. I'm curious how you deal with instability due to Kind of dual writers and partial success and things like that. 
In, in, okay, uh, I, I've got some follow-up questions for your question, so don't. Uh, okay, so the question was like, curious how, how you deal with instability around um, kind of du dual right and uh, and things like that. Can you? What do you mean by by instability? Or what's an example you can think of? Um, so one example would be you're writing to two places. You write to system A and it succeeds, and then you write to system B and it fails. Yeah. Yeah, so, so you're writing system A and it succeeds, system B it fails. So I would say that's a really good thing to find out, right? Like if you're writing to the new system and sometimes it fails, you might want to know that, right? So like in general with these migrations, you're using the exact code path or the exact kind of like data flow path or code path that you're planning to use anyway. You're just kind of like starting to use it early and using it in parallel. So like, I think that's, in general, is my answer, is like, you kind of want to find out. There's, there's some arguments of like, well, if you're doing it in parallel, then you're doing twice as much work, and maybe that's going to cause some, some extra issues. And I think, I think you, my answer to that would be like, I think that's a good trade-off, basically. I don't know if that answered the question. Yeah. OK. Any other questions? Oh, OK. Yeah, uh, can I follow up to that question is, the migration is a special use case, right? It is not, um, you know, the, you're trying to push as much load as possible sometimes, and the writing is happening from the, you know, maybe the backfill and the writing is happening. So failures there may not be, you know, the question is more like, do you have like retry mechanisms for handling these or? That kind of do, do you have what mechanism? Sorry, uh, retry. Oh, uh, for the for the backfill. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, th I think like uh, so. I, I think the the question is like if you're doing this kind of dual writing at the same time and you're also doing the the, the backfill. Like, how do you how do you like how do you handle doing both of those at the same time, or how do you kind no, of handle? No, them? the thing is like the errors that he mentioned ah. are likely to happen at those cases. Yeah. Not the normal use case. Why would they be more likely to happen? Because the database is under where Oh, got like, it, right, like you're, you're like load. making it work way harder. Yeah. Yeah, so, so like by doing both things at once, you're, in, you're kind of putting a lot more stress on the system, so, so how do you handle that? I mean, I think it's, most of the, in most of my experience, like you can figure out a way to do it so that you're not like overloading the system. Like the backfills, for example, they can trickle along really slowly because you're not in a rush because you know the cops aren't arriving in seven <laughs> minutes, right? Um, and for the, for the dual writing, most of the time, I mean, I guess if you're doing like a dual write of like a database schema change, then you're, 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 you're doing double the load. So I think basically you just have to have, your system needs to be okay with, with, with more load. And again, I think that's, that's a, a good trade-off for the amount of safety that you get. Now for my real question, <laughs> so can, uh, can you suggest ways for using this for a CI CD pipeline where uh, we are switching from using VMs to containers? For OK, great. So can I, can, how do I do expand contract on my CI CD pipeline when you're switching from one technology to another? So someone gave us this example of that they were doing this with Azure. Either they worked at Azure or they were using Azure. I'm not sure which one. Um, and it, you, t you take the same approach. You, you stand up a new version of the pipeline um, that's, that's kind of running in parallel. And you kind of have it do all the things apart from maybe the, the last part where it like pushes the artifact to the artifact repository or whatever. So you would, you would have the two running side by side. And maybe you have to make some compromises. And you kind of say, like, you stop the new thing from, from like all of its side effects. So you stop it from actually kind of like publishing things to the artifact repo or from like deploying things to production. And maybe that last part, you do have to do like a big switch over. Um, sometimes there's, there's not a way around it. But most of it, you can run it side by side and get more confidence. And then the risky part, you've kind of squished down the surface area of the risky part, I would say. But that, that example of like kind of migrating CI CD pipelines, I've, I've definitely seen, I've done that myself, I think, where I've like stood up a new provider and we just, like, again, the two things should look the same. So I would be very comfortable saying the new system deploys to the, art, or like pushes the artifact to the artifact repository and the old system does and we just push them twice. Like it should, it should be the same, it doesn't really matter, right? And if it's not the same, then uh, maybe that's something you need to fix. 
uh, so we kind of did that when the major, major concern was the code duplication, right? So now we have two sets of code yeah. and people modifying this code may forget to. Yeah, yeah, so it sounds a great question. So, so like what you've got two, two versions of the thing running in parallel. People are gonna like have to keep both the old and the new thing in sync. That is a really good thing that I, I wish I'd have thought to talk about in the talk. So I love my metaphors involving lakes, I guess. <laughs> this to me is like all of these migrations are like you're in the boat, you wanna get to the shore, you do this part, you don't wanna be in this situation for too long because the boat's going one way, the shore's not, right? <laughs> I've seen, like, the hardest part of these technical migrations is committing to getting it done, right? Like, the, the, that's the riskiest part, is two years later, someone comes along and says, why do we write to Mongo and Postgres? <laughs> well, there was this, like, lead architect that was here, and he had this idea. Like, that, that, there's a, that's a big risk, right? Um, and it's something that you need to deal with is like you need to get the funding and the organizational support and all the boring like non-technical like people stuff in place to make sure that you actually get the migration done. I think it's a good trade-off. I think it's worth that risk, but it is definitely like one of the risks with using this approach is because you can take your time, maybe you're gonna take too much time, right? Thank yeah, you. thanks for asking. Hey, I was um, really interested in the I forget if you call it like dual read, but the situation where you're essentially reading from two different sources. In parallel run. Par yeah, parallel read or run. Yes. Yeah, so, so I was really interested in like, uh, especially considering how you're saying you probably don't want to do like a full bit for bit comparison, but like more of a semantic or logical comparison between these two answers. Uh, the more I thought about that, the more like scared I was that if I had to do that in real life, I would screw that logic up or or make some poor assumptions or something mm -hmm. like that. And, and even though my tests or my unit tests around those comparisons look good, the comparisons in real life might, might not be good, yeah. right? Like my assumptions. That, so like, I, I guess I'm wondering, do you have advice on how to actually make sure you're doing that right? Like, like do you actually plan, like, and, and even monitoring and like um, alerting on that? Like, do you like maybe physically plant some bad account in the new account yeah. management and make sure that your alerting all works if, the, if it doesn't? Yeah. line up correctly, like I, I'm just looking for more thoughts on that. Yeah, okay, so I'm gonna summarize that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so like how do, you, how do you do that parallel, when you're doing parallel run, how do you do that discrepancy chest, how do you get with, confident? With, with, that, with confidence, yeah, and, and, like, yeah. yeah. So one thing that I've done, it, so it's kind of like writing integration tests. It's basically an integration test, so basically like do what you would do with an integration test and, and kind of follow your heart. Um, there's an element that um, one, t one thing that I've done, and I kind of said this facetiously earlier, is I will push that, like start running it early, and I'm expecting the numbers to not line up, and that help, and, and like just slowly whittle down where they don't agree. Like, oh, we didn't handle this use case. Great, mm -hmm. we're going to handle that now. And that act of seeing it fail kind of gets you more confident. Mm -hmm. That so you're don't, don't wait until you think you have it perfect. Like actually, maybe push push yeah. it before then. And, yeah, because you no, make it sure it fails it. the yeah. way you expect. Yeah, it gives you. It's a. It's another. It's another opportunity for feedback, right? And you're getting feedback in production. You're kind of testing in production, but not in the annoying way with the guy, in the meme. Great. Um, yeah. Thank yeah. you.